<laughs> I would like to uh, convene this meeting of August 4th of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, can we have a roll call, Molly? President Mayhood? Here. Vice President Ackman? Here. Director Fulz? Here. Director Hill? Here. Director Smalley? Here. Are there any additions or deletions to the close uh, to the agenda? The staff has none, Chair. Okay. Um, I don't, let's see, I don't think I see any, this is the time for oral communications, but I don't think I see any members of the public. So I guess there won't be any um, public comments. So we will now adjourn to the closed session. Okay, uh, all counted for. So let's go ahead and reconvene this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, can we take a roll call vote, please, Holly? President Mayhood? Here. Vice President Ackerman? Here. Director Fulz? Here. Director Hill? Here. Director Smalley? Here. Okay. Um, there were no actions taken in the closed session this evening. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Rick, uh, any additions or deletions? No? No uh, additions or deletions. Okay. Apologies, <laughs> I was reading the agenda. Right. Sure, that one clarification. There was the one clarification, Rick, on the um, uh, which one was it? The Santa Cruz County Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Yeah, the, the agenda item says uh, that we will be also um, presenting uh, on the conjunctive use uh, item 10A, the oh. budget authorization, and mm -hmm. the budget authorization will not be uh, presented tonight. Uh, most likely it'll be brought back to the second meeting in August and be presented uh, to the board uh, for review at that time. Okay, so takes one thing off of our plate tonight. Um, are there any uh, oral communications for, from the public? These are on issues within the purview of the district, but not on the agenda tonight. Thank you. April, Cynthia, or Mark, raise your hand if you have anything you'd like to address us with tonight. Otherwise, I will go on to the president's um, report and just report very briefly on the last meeting of the Santa Margarita Groundwater Association. It happened late last month. Um, two things of note. Uh, the Santa Margarita board uh, accepted um, with surprising unanimity uh, a response to the grand jury report uh, that I think most of you would be very happy with. It very much harmonizes with the views that, that we uh, said in our own uh, report. The other was that Carly presented for the district um, those projects that we would like to kind of take the lead on that would be our contribution to a grant proposal that we're planning to put together uh, this uh, winter um, for the first projects that are called the PMAs, the project management actions um, for the groundwater district, which includes moving ahead um, a lot of things that have to do with the constructive use plan. And I, I just want to compliment Carly. She did a nice job presenting it and especially did especially nice job in answering some of the questions um, afterwards. So let's go ahead and go on with unfinished business, um, which means that we will turn to Carly. Great, thank you. So just as some background, uh, the conjunctive use plan was originally developed jointly with the County of Santa Cruz under a wildlife conservation grant in 2017. Uh, during that grant period, we accomplished two studies, including a water availability assessment, along with a resource conserv or resource uh, fisheries resource considerations report, along with the conjunctive use plan itself and a CEQA analysis. 
that CEQA analysis was an initial study mitigated negative declaration or ISMND. Uh, the ISMND went to the public for review from July 28th through August 31st, 2021. Uh, during that time, significant public concerns were raised and the district and legal counsel recommended that we go through a more thorough CEQA analysis through the completion of an environmental impact report or EIR. At the November 2021 Board of Directors meeting, the board approved moving ahead with the environmental consultant, Rincon Consultants, Inc., who had completed the ISMND for the district uh, to then update the project description for the focus EIR under the district manager's purchasing authority of $30,000. That drafted updated project description is shown as Exhibit A. And within that project description, there is bracketed information that needs additional review or further analysis. Uh, that information really cannot be updated until we have discussions or further discussions with the city of Santa Cruz regarding the district's Lock Loman allotment and their further technical analysis and modeling that's completed. Also included as part of this memo is a tentative schedule for moving ahead the conjunctive use plan uh, EIR, and that's included as Exhibit B. If there is interest, all these documents can be found on the district's website, including the conjunctive use plan, the ISMND, the water availability assessment, and the fisheries resource considerations report. I mean, it is recommended that the board review this memo and approve the updated project description and the tentative schedule for the district's conjunctive use plan environmental impact report. District staff is prepared to answer questions from the board and public. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to kind of go around and get comments from everybody on the board. And let me start with the uh, chair of our environment, engineering and environmental group, Mark. Yes. Um, <clears throat> The engineering or the environmental committee, since that's what it was at the time, uh, in November or December um, last year, reviewed the draft IS, uh, the draft environmental impact statement at that point. Um, we provided comments to them. This revised project description um, addresses those comments in particular the removal of um, selling water to Scotts Valley and uh, changing uh, monitoring or water rights aspects uh, at the big trees gauges. So I appreciate that those have been done. Um, I agree with what's in this project description now. So I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, Bob, you're also on that committee. Uh, yes. And did you want comments or questions or both? Both. <laughs> oh, both? Okay. I mean, we, uh, we can do multiple rounds here, so don't feel like you have to do every single question or comment, but let's, let's kind of take high level ones first and then we can drill down. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So at a high level, um, I, I just want to, you know, reiterate what I think I've said before at previous meetings, which is that I'm um, 100 percent in support of moving this district to a uh, operational framework that allows us to take water from any source and deliver it to any destination within our district. We will not be able to achieve the operational efficiencies that we need to have until we get to that state, in, in my opinion. Um, so anything that moves us down that path is a good thing. Um, I did want to ask a question, though, Carly, about what you characterize as significant public uh, comment. Um, who, I mean, to me, that makes it sound like there's there was a lot of public comment from a lot of different people. Who, who was it that commented on our uh, ISMND and presumably a negative fashion? Right, we did receive uh, comments from many of the permitting agencies such as CDFW and uh, NIMPS, uh, but the, the main one that we received that kind of seemed like it was posing itself for litigation was from the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and that's, we have been working through some of their comments currently as well, along with our discussions around the Loch Lomond uh, allotment, but it, it one of the main ones did come from the city. 
Yeah, I'd I, like I mean, I support. Uh, I was just going to support Bob's reaction. I had the same reaction when I saw uh, significant public. To me, public that, means members of the public jumping that, up that, and down, and that, that, that is, is not what we had. Right, and, that is not public. That's that's insiders. And um, and I and I remember when you gave your talk at Santa Margarita, I had the same reaction, which was. I, I don't want people at Santa Margarita or anybody else to think that the public is opposed to this because I think most of our public is actually in favor of it. Oh, and, I, yeah. yeah. So I, I think I think the public yeah. recognizes the immediate and unbelievable environmental benefits that could be had to the district and in fact to the greater community if we were able to implement this as fast as possible. The fact that we're not able to do that. Um, here by going through an EIR, I think has um, probably our public sort of wondering what happened. So I wanted to make sure we clarified that. This this was not a broad-based public resistance to this at all. Um, okay. I think you could just fix that by just taking out public in the first part, just saying that there was significant comment during public and, you know, without, if you don't really want to go on and blame uh, you know, and be explicit about those agencies that we think fomented most of the opposition. Uh, Gina? I just wanted to apologize for the phrase significant public concern. That's a little bit of, of, of legalese that essentially says um, we received comments of significant enough concern to revisit some of the issues contained in the environmental analysis, and that's primarily because of the comments of the city of Santa Cruz. Yeah. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to identify who the agencies were to make sure it's clear that there was zero real public comment from it because the public supports this overwhelmingly. I mean, if it's not 90%, I'd be really surprised. Um, okay, let me see if I had any other significant questions before I go back to some of the other ones. Um, I think my only other sort of broad comment on this is that I, I think the project description didn't highlight enough the conjunctive use portion of this. And, and I think I understand why, which is there's not a lot of actual construction work that needs to take place. It's more a sort of bureaucratic release of the um, emergency designation to allowing us to do what is operationally in everybody's best interests, including the fish. Um, but I, I think there needs to be a little bit more meat on that particular set of bones to even in the project description to, to make it really clear to the public what it is we're talking about doing here. And while I understand this is intended to be something for uh, consultants and environmentalists and that sort of thing, I, I do think a significant strategic initiative like this needs to be clear enough to the public that it's understandable by a, a broad set of people. Okay. I do have other questions, but I'll come back to those. I, I will come back to you, Bob. Jamie? No, no problem. Um, Gina had her hand up, and I just wanted to make sure that she had jumped in and said whatever it was that she felt she needed to say. Okay. Yes, thank you. So, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, I, I think, you know, generally, um, you know, I, I support the goals of the conjunctive use plan as it's laid out here. And I think, you know, from my, you know, perspective on on how we um, position, you know, what what we are doing here to make sure that the public, you know, has the maximum understanding of the benefits, um, I'm, you know, I think that, you know, attaching some kind of an executive summary, or even, you know, maybe there's some value in doing a little bit of media um, when, you know, we release this to answer some questions practically. I'm not talking about the board, I'm talking about the staff. Um, maybe, you know, just to, if we are concerned that the public may have questions about this, that we want to clarify, you know, issuing some kind of an executive summary or, you know, overview statement that just sort of identifies the, you know, purpose, the benefits that we see of the conjunctive use long term, and then, you know, sort of the the timeline for going forward with the EIR process. Um, that might be, uh, you know, something that can come later, but be of value to the public in terms of disseminating the document. I think that's a great idea because also it yeah. helps us if you know this ever comes to uh, we, we want the public to back us and be there to speak in uh, support of it. 
Um, okay, uh, Jeff. Okay, so the farther down we go, the more uh, the things I might have wanted to talk about have been covered, but um, um, all I think it's a very good plan. It needs a little fine tuning here and there. It needs a little bit more upfront explanation. And I do think uh, I agree with Jamie entirely that we need to be prepared to do a thorough selling job on this and uh, make sure that it's perfectly and completely clear to the public and to the other agencies that might be involved. But uh, I'm a very strong supporter of this whole concept. Uh, and is that, are you finished, Jeff? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess just want to echo what everybody else has said that um, I am in full support of what we did. And I think that you were very smart to take Mark's suggestion of uh, hiving off the uh, Scotts Valley part of it um, as just creating potential problems for us and really sticking to the essential part for us. Um, and the, the part that basically sets us on a course um, to really uh, be pretty drought resilient, I think, in the long haul. And so I, um, I'm, you know, I'm feeling if we can get this all done, I'm feeling actually, I know nobody likes to talk about this, but I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic about our district's ability um, to, to take care of its needs. And I, and I think this is, you know, really a great thing. Um, so I, I just have a few little nitpicky things that have to do with it. One was this, the one that, uh, that uh, Bob already brought up. Another one was, I thought it was important when we were talking about the amounts of water that were available um, to be used, that you made it clear that the amounts available, especially in, in the Felton system, were those above and beyond the ones that were, we are required to leave in the stream for the fish. Okay, so I, I think that, that we just want to, you know, and if you need to be boring, I mean, even repeat it several times that, you know, all of these calculations are truly excess flows. Um, that, that in the sense that they're excess over what we need to keep in the creeks to allow adult fish to migrate, to wash the small fish out into the ocean. Um, and that we're doing that. Plus, we know that um, if we pump less, you know, and, and I think you can, you've already said it, but you can still build that up a little bit more about how the benefits are for the fisheries. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I, I think eventually we'll do more modeling with Santa Margarita and have a better handle on exactly, you know, what these are. But, um, you know, you say that we, we add a, you know, 0 0.5 CFS, which sounds really small, but in drought years, in some of those creeks, in Bean, Bean Creek and Zianti Creek, the flows are so small that, you know, 0 0.5 may make the difference between, you know, whether you're at the, the height that a, a salmon, you know, you've got to have a height that's about half salmon height for them to jump, and um, that that might make the difference. So that these, these are important. Um, so I, I, you know, I would I'd be more boastful. You know, <laughs> say all the good things that we're doing. Okay, um, maybe I'll go out to the public before we come for another round um, with the board, if, if the board doesn't mind. Um, uh, we're up to four whole panelists now. Are there any comments by members of the public at this point? Cynthia, please go ahead. Good evening. Um, I am, I'm not as familiar with what you're doing currently as I should be, but I do have a question about communicating with the public. Um, I would like part of the plan to include how you tell the public when it's time to stop using water um, and whether that depends like would that be at the point when you're changing from the surface water in Fall Creek, for instance, to having to uh, draw water out of the aquifer? Or the fact that we have septic systems, are we actually putting water back into the system um, that then helps the river flow? 
what's the what's the delay time between us using water and it coming out in the river and helping the fish? Um, I I think my problem is a little bit the how the public is integrated into this plan for conjunct conjunctive use. I totally support the idea of pumping the water up to the north system um, and having it flow back down into the river and not pumping water out um, at, the diver at the diversion in Felton if Santa Cruz can get its water lower down and let the fish survive, you know, in the upper reaches of the river certain times of the year. But I just would like a little more clar clarification on what the public can do. Can I take a stab at that first? <laughs> and then Rick will, will let you do it. Um, when you asked how fast um, does the effluent go, you know, from your wastewater and septic tanks and in, into the creeks, it's very much dependent on what your geology is. And so, for example, if you're in Felton and on the um, Lompico or on the granitic bedrock, it takes quite a while, years. If you're in the Santa Margarita formation over by Quail Hollow, it, it could be pretty fast uh, within a year. It will be hitting the Monterey Formation, which is an aquaclude, and it'll be in the Anti Creek or Bean Creek. Um, so, but it, it kind of doesn't matter in terms of this, the the time. The point is, is all of the water that goes into septic systems eventually benefits the groundwater system. I I agree with you with the idea that we could maybe do a little bit more. So for example, I think that everybody would be really happy to know that this year we only shifted over from surface water to pumping our wells and what, Rick, was it in June that we did that? And it, and even though this was a drought uh, winter because we had that big storm in October. And so Annual. what that means is, and, and so I think that, you know, that that would not be unreasonable, Rick, for us to like, alert the public and say, okay, um, you know, we're to the point now where we're having to shift over to our wells either because we don't have enough water in the creeks or we have to leave water in the creek for the fish in Fall Creek um, so that they can do their thing. Um, and that this is the time you really have to worry about conserving. Um, so I, is there any reason we couldn't do that? Well, we. We did just recently when we switched over to the well, the Olympia well uh, field, we did do uh, outreach on that because it's a, sh a sharp contrast of water. I can't hear Rick. Rick, you're kind of faint. Yeah. Any better? Mm -hmm. um, and, no, you can't hear me? Okay. But we did, we did do that this year. We did put out uh, social media and we did put out, uh, I do believe, uh, some other information when we switched over to the Olympia well field. Our customers can tell the change of water uh, as soon as they receive it at the tap with the higher mineral content and the content and the iron and manganese in the Olympia wells. We can do a better job of that. And as far as our, our customers, you know, time, you know, uh, to not use water, our customers are, have some of the lowest water use rates in the state. Yeah. And to ask our customers to conserve more might start impacting health and safety. And um, get to a point that, you know, I'm not quite sure how much more our customers can could reduce uh, their use. Um, we can do more information on what water sources are being. We could even update our website to, you know, um, to, to, to mark down a, some type of bar chart or something that says where the water is coming from uh, this month or something. I wouldn't want to change it daily. That's, that's kind of difficult. But to update it more the times of year, maybe we can have a, some type of system map up and with some color coding. Uh, we can work on that uh, as part of uh, outreach where our water comes from. Um, and the best thing to do is the, to utilize our surface water first without impacting fish and then utilizing the Loch Lomond water because that will allow us not to use our, our well water and leave more water in the aquifer and leave more water uh, in the streams. Um, but it's a little complicated um, to get out and we'd have to do a little work to make sure folks could understand what they're looking at uh, when they're reading it, not to be too confusing. Does that answer your question, Cynthia, a little bit? 
I hope so. I, right now, well, let's let's move on to Jim Mosher. He's got his hand up. Okay, Jim. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I just want to support the board in their efforts here on the conjunctive use. I was uh, uh, dismayed about what the city of Santa Cruz uh, did with their protest. I really appreciate Bob's comments. Um, and in terms of conservation, it seems to me one way, one area that the board could help customers is in the area of garden irrigation. Um, I, I would bet that where we could do more conservation is in that area. I know just personally that uh, my wife and I are, are reviewing um, what we could do. Uh, most of our water use is in irrigating our vegetable garden and flower garden. And uh, we have, for example, pulled out our entire lawn. Um, and so there, I think where we could still conserve is in that area. And it's been very educational for me to learn that there's certain types, certain times of the year where it's more important for us to do that in order to preserve the health of the aquifer and the uh, watershed um, than others. So anyway, that's one area that I think more uh, customer education would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, Rick. If I can just add to that, one of the things that we are doing and we need, uh, we've actually put in for additional grant funding uh, to speed up uh, this program is the meter change out to the Badger Ion Water uh, meters that give our customers, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20, almost 24 hours later, their water use. And really, there's a, everybody who I spoke to who uses the Ion Water says it is the best tool that we've offered to help uh, uh, monitor water use, look for leaks, uh, and give people a good idea of the actual water they're using almost in real time. It's 24 hours behind. Um, that's a great tool, and we're working. Uh, we uh, put in for more grants uh, for that under drought, and we do have an active program of changing out those meters. Okay. Any other comments by uh, members of the public? I don't see any, so let's go ahead and go back to uh, members, members of the board. <clears throat> uh, Mark. Um, one thing that I've heard from several of the board members and I agree with is uh, providing the overriding executive summary for what this uh, document uh, is about. Um, and Carly, we didn't have uh, section one that uh, in the final document will precede this uh, project description. A am I correct in that that's where this executive summary would then live? Right. Is in that's, that that's section, section one? Right. Okay. As part of the, the approved budget, it was really only updating the project description. Correct. That was part of the cap that we put on on you and Rick in approving that under thirty thousand was the project description by itself. Okay. Okay. Then at some point, I think early, fairly early on in the process, uh, once we do go ahead with the this environmental impact report, having that executive summary back to the board so that we can uh, review it and reflect our opinions on, does this convey not only to the regulators, but to the general public also, what this document contains, what we think should be in it. Okay, that's my only comment, thanks. Bob? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that an executive summary is needed, but I still think section two sort of missed the mark on the <laughs> non Loch Lomond um, projects. Um, so, I mean, I think the concept, you know, pedal the metal on the concept on the policy, but I think there's still some work to be done in section two as well. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things in, in response to earlier comments. One is, um, while the 
the notion of selling water to Scotts Valley as part of normal operations is not part of this. I do want to make it clear to our neighbors in Scotts Valley that in, in emergency times, if, if they need water for due to an emergency, we will clearly provide that as I would expect they would to us in, in reverse if we had an emergency that needed water. That has been done in the past and th there will be no change to that as, as far as I can tell, correct? Or, yeah, I'm That's taking that as a yes. Yeah. Right. Um, specifically on the water conservation, there may be some things that people can do for outdoor conservation, no question. Though if you live in the sand hills, it, it gets a little tougher when you're watering outdoors. Um, but indoor water use, as Rick said, you know, we're at 35 to 40 gallons per person per day indoor use. That is tw at least 20% below the Oldman State goal of 50 gallons. So I, I, I'm really, you know, there's an asymptote you get here as you continue to push on conservation. We need to be very focused in what our messaging really is. And, you know, pushing folks on indoor conservation, I think we're reaching a a point of vanishing returns. It, 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 we're not going to get a whole lot more out of it. It's also the time of year when we have the most water. Well, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, so, go ahead, take another shower. <laughs> well, I mean, and price, of course, does a lot to um, uh, you know uh, deal with that too. Water is not a completely inelastic uh, commodity, as we've as we've learned. I mean, I think it would be instructive at some point, Rick to take a look at how much water we were putting out on a per person uh, basis back in the 80s and 90s. I can tell you, looking at my old bills when I was throwing things away, you know, I was using a heck of a lot more water than I am now, like um, probably three or four times as much. And uh, I think that is something that would be very instructive for people to understand, to get some perspective historically that, that our district has come down a significant amount. I mean, it's large amount in our water consumption on a per person basis. Okay, to the question. Um, what is the nearest point of connection in Felton um, to the uh, South System interconnect from Kirby? Is that down um, Graham Hill Road? to uh, Zianti graham Hill inter intersection? You're saying the closest to Kirby to our south system? Yeah. Uh, that route would be uh, Highway 9 to Glen Arbor, Glen Arbor to Quail Hollow, Quail Hollow to uh, West Zianti, or East Zianti, West Zianti, and then over Graham Hill. Okay, so you wouldn't go down, um, you just wouldn't go down Graham Hill to Zianti? Not at this time. It, it's, a, it's a very, the piping in there, is unique and uh, it would have to be completely replaced from the Felton intersection down to Graham Hill. Right, but I mean, that is the nearest distance one. That's the shortest as the crow flies, yes. Yeah. But that, okay. we do not have piping to facilitate that. Right, I understand, I understand. But I mean, that is the shortest, okay. Um, just a little nit on the map. We're showing a bunch of um, existing intakes um, I think we talked about this before. By existing, we mean those are pre-1914 water rates. But at, at least not all of them are currently in, in, in operation. In the, north system, in the north system, the only uh, sur surface source in operation right now is Foreman Creek. Right. And that's because of CZU. Yeah, I did notice that, um, and this may be something to look at in the executive summary, but we didn't talk in the section here about pre-1914, which gives us a little bit more flexibility than um, our water rights in Felton, for example. I think I'd just add to that that it, it's important not to just show Foreman Creek, because that's a that's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. CZU fire. So, so what we want are the ones that were active pre-August 2020. Yes, yeah. so that, yeah. that seems to be the logical ones to show on yeah. that map. Yeah, I just don't want, I mean, it, I don't want anybody to think those are operational now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to the numbers and the tables as soon as you have them. Um, I think that would be very instructive. And as Gail said before, 
some perspective on that relative to how much we could use over what is needed for fish is would be really important. Um, on the interconnection uh, with Loch Lomond, why would we not want to tie it in at the closest and least expensive place there at San Lorenzo Way? There is no reason we don't, I mean, we do want to tie in at that location. Okay. Because that's still an open question, I guess. Well, it came up in the review of the ISMND and we just need to, to nail that down. And we have had conversation with the city. I think we're close to uh, uh, nailing that location down. Okay. There was some operational concerns the city had and I think those have been resolved. Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that our staff knows how to operate um, water systems. Um, and then for going uh, cross nine, would we bore or would we trench? Most we... likely that will be a, a Caltrans decision. Uh, at that location, they may require a bore due to the high level of traffic. Uh, especially, especially there. Okay. Great, thank you, that was it. Okay. Um, Jamie, did you have any additional questions? No, oh, I do sorry, not. Sorry, you got your mouth full. I'll go on to Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, did you have any questions? Potter. No, not at this time. Okay. Jamie, go ahead. I, I was saying no, I did not, but you know, because my mouth was full, it was difficult <laughs> to understand me. Well, then I see that Mark has his hand up. So let's go back to Mark. Um, I was going to pass on this comment, but since Bob brought up figure 2-3 with the labels on it, um, we label everything on that figure existing. And when I see that, I, I want to contrast, okay, so what's not existing? Well, nothing. Everything there is existing. Are any of them labeled inactive? No. Are any of them labeled as future? No. Take out the word existing, and then nobody is going to debate. To Bob's point earlier, uh, Clear Creek, Peavine, uh, Sweetwater. Those are intakes. We're not attempting to say whether they're existing or not. We're, take the word existing off of that figure entirely is my suggestion. That's it. Okay. Any more comments from members of the board? Um, if not, I think what we would like to do, if um, you don't mind, is just send generally from, I get sort of from the sense of the conversation here, that there's consensus of the board, that there's a lot of support for um, the CUP project description as it's been constructed. We've had some minor um, comments on how it might be made a little bit more accessible to the public. And what I would um, like to, to do is to have the board agree that um, we want the staff to proceed full speed ahead on the plan as it is. Um, and that if any members of the board have some minor suggestions for rewording or rewriting that they uh, submit them to, to you and to Gina in, within the next two weeks, if that seems reasonable. Um, and, but otherwise, um, is that, um, Gina, you have something you want to say? I was just going to make a plug for, um, if possible, kind of conceptual points as opposed to expensive redlining. And, and part of the reason for that is that there's you know, there's me, there's Carly, there's me, there's a biologist, and there's Rincon who kind of all have to go. It, it'll be difficult to reach agreement on extensive red lines from multiple parties um, with a concurrence from all the different consultants. Uh, I think if you give us conceptual points that we can sort of figure out how to incorporate that will work, but not to say don't send us red lines if there's something that you think can be best communicated that way, but I'm just requesting not a lot of extensive red lines, please. Okay. Um, so uh, 
can I just have a, just, let's just have a voice vote on whether we want to express that uh, consensus. All in favor, say yes. 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 All, right. yes. All opposed? Anybody abstaining? Okay, so everybody's got their marching orders. So let's go ahead and go on to the first order of new business, which is the Santa Cruz County Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Great, thank you. I'll also be speaking on that item tonight. Um, in April of 2022, the district applied for funding through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, which is a FEMA Cal OES uh, grant funding program. Originally, when we spoke with Cal OES, we were told that we were eligible to apply on our own. Unfortunately, after we had completed the SAP applications, we're ready to submit those. Uh, we were then told that we were not eligible to be a sub applicant because we did not have a local hazard mitigation plan. And at that point, because we were so far, far along in the process, we ended up contacting the County of Santa Cruz who does have an approved local hazard mitigation plan. And the County did agree that they would uh, be the sub applicant on these, these applications for the district. Um, during that time, we discussed uh, putting together a man memorandum of understanding or MOU with the county that would commit the district to completing the work um, as outlined in those applications, along with funding 25% of the eligible activity cost, which is the required match as part of the program. The three sub applications include fire hardening of three redwood tanks and four polyurethane tanks. Um, and hard fire hardening here refers to complete replacement with steel, uh, bolted steel tanks along with hardening two HDPE lines in Lompico and then Bennett and Felton, uh, and that would be burying those lines. And then the Cal OES uh, staff that we worked with recommended that we complete our own local hazard mitigation plan, so in the future we could apply for this funding on our own. Um, so as uh, exhibit A, we have the actual MOU attached, and then below that we also have a better description of the projects that we did submit as part of the applications. And I believe Rick wanted to jump in and give a little more information on each of those projects. Uh, the projects that were selected uh, were high priority projects on our capital improvement list and even you know, rise higher priority after CZU fire. Um, and, and these are, when we say fire hardening, this isn't you know, just brush removal, this is complete replacement. Uh, the echo tanks, the redwood uh, type tanks that we would uh, replace, that's in the North Boulder Creek system. The Highland tank is a redwood tank located in Boulder Creek. Uh, the Ralston, El Solo, South Reservoir, and Eckley are, are polyethylene tanks that are obviously very susceptible uh, to heat and, and fire. Uh, the Bennett line is a, a, an above ground line that's through a forested area. Um, the Lumpico line is the main line uh, that was installed uh, through an emergency grant when Lumpico uh, was a water district when they had a water supply shortage during a drought before we consolidated. The pipeline was installed above ground cross country, uh, HDPE, very susceptible to fire damage as we learned um, during CZU. These are all considered capital improvements. Um, the 25% uh, that the district share would be is 1.7 million. I think this would be over a, a three year period. If we can get awarded the, the 7.1 million um, uh, for the full projects, we will uh, appropriate uh, the 1.7 million uh, for capital improvements. And we'd be happy to take any questions on any of those individual projects. Amy. Um, can you remind me, the Bennett line, is that the one um, that sort of comes down Ben Lomond Mountain? It's correct. It's off Empire Grade. It comes out of the Bennett uh, Spring, uh, quite a ways up Empire Grade, then runs cross country and comes all the way down to the town of Belton to the Kirby Water Treatment Plant. Some of that was damaged in CZU, but uh, only about 50%, so there's still additional piping that needs to be uh, uh, buried when we do the project. And this uh, money if awarded would cover those costs. And can you just um, 
in the area that we would be looking at undergrounding it, um, if if it's the area that I'm somewhat familiar with, because it's kind of up behind my house, is it is it near Manson Creek? Is that where we're no, thinking? No, of? no, no, no. no. Okay. Uh, way up Empire Grade, yeah. up by the lime kilns. I'm not sure you're familiar. Oh, up okay. Fall Creek okay. State Park. So yeah. Considerably uh, away from uh, the Manson, and the Manson, the district uh, deeded that property over to uh, state parks. We no longer own that or use that water source from Manson. Uh, oh, okay, great. I was just going to ask about um, slide risk, though, but it sounds like it's a lot lower than I was thinking it was, and so would not be as subject to potential slides if we were undergrounding it in that location. Yeah, the, the topography up uh, on Bennett is a lot different than our other um, our other intakes. It is not as steep at all. Yeah, I, I happen to be on the Bennett line. <laughs> yes, <she does. laughs> it, it, uh, and I live a half mile uphill from from uh, Dalton, and a lot of it is over granitic terrain, and so there isn't the same amount of uh, landslides. Much shall as Rick said, much shallower than the east side of uh, Ben Lomond Mountain. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Um, yes, thank you. So the, the first thing I want to do is. Um, mentioned that uh, I live across the street from the Highland Tank, which is my wa why my water pressure is, is so fabulous. Um, and I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any conflict of interest situation for me by voting on this. Yeah, go ahead. Why don't we, this actually came up with things related to me on stuff too. So Gina, why don't you expand on that? Yeah. So. Um, Without reciting the, the all the, the kind of legal rules that apply here, I think the key principle at play is that um, there wouldn't be a conflict here because there wouldn't be any material effect on a director's um, financial interest. And that's because uh, it's under the law, it's not considered material if the, if the decision solely concerns repairs, replacement, or maintenance of existing streets, water, et cetera, facilities. Um, I think there's an additional concept here as well, which is that if a director is receiving the same type of service as other members of the public and this type of an improvement wouldn't change, you know, the nature or type of service that the director is receiving, then it doesn't constitute a disqualifying conflict. But really the key point is that it, if there if there is a financial interest, it's not material under the legal rules that apply to um, conflicts of interest and therefore it doesn't disqualify you, Bob, or any other director that may be served by one of the um, you know, particular infrastructure elements that's on the list. Great, thank you. Uh, Jeff. Oh, wait, 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 wait a sec, I had another question. Well, I'll come back to you. Jeff, okay. go ahead. Okay, real simple, quick, short question here. In the document, it refers to the, to the non-redwood tanks as polyurethane tanks, and you mentioned polyethylene tanks. Um, I seriously doubt that they're polyurethane, but make sure you got that right. And that was a, that was a typo on my end. Sorry yes, about that. Yeah. <laughs> Large chemical difference between polyurethane and polyethylene. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to you, Bob. I, yes, yeah, so, you know, as, as I was thinking about tanks here, Rick, it, it occurred to me that one of our other major unfunded uh, liabilities that, that we still need to find a financial solution for is maintenance of our steel tank. Um, I believe that it, all of the steel tanks we have, except perhaps for probation, and the lion tanks that were damaged in the fire and which were recoded um, as part of that repair, are well out of their maintenance life for being recoded. Are we able to apply for um, grant funding for those for that kind of activity? As part of this funding, um, the hazard mitigation grant, they do have you do uh, at least five years of maintenance in the cost that we put together as part of the application. So, well, what what does mind. that exactly mean for um, for maintenance of these? Because these are all going to be replaced with steel tanks, presumably either welded or bolted, 
What does that mean? Yeah, I wish Josh was on this call. He's been working on the the maintenance and project end a lot more than I have for these this funding. Um, I mean, I mean, might one, be able to, I mean one, yeah, one, one thing that, that occurs to me is if we're setting aside money in a sinking fund of some kind for future maintenance, that's certainly a reasonable thing to do. We have not done that um, as part of our financial planning up until now, but that is something to consider. But, but more importantly, it sounds like we are not able to apply for grant funding for maintenance on our steel tanks at this point, out of this, out of this grant out, uh, funds anyway. Is that correct? Mm, I, I believe that's correct. Because the, the, the goal of this program is to, to mitigate for hazards, right? So really maintenance wouldn't be mitigating for any hazard. It, you know, getting construction funds is, pretty straightforward, maintaining things gets a little bit trickier. And as we ramp up our um, steel tank infrastructure, which based on what I've heard Rick say in the past can be unlimited life as long as you maintain it properly. Um, our maintenance requirements here, particularly given the age of some of our steel tanks really need to ramp up, but that'll be a topic for another uh, conversation. I just wanted to make sure that we couldn't get some money for these as well. And then on the Lompico line, just to clarify that, because I think I was a little confused by it, we're talking about burying the um, supply line that goes from Zianti into Lompico. Is that correct, Rick? Is, do I understand that correctly? Yeah, and that was put in before the consolidation. By the right. And that's and, HD. Right, and that is not part. That is not part of the assessment district funds. This would be separate from that. That's correct. So it, it would actually be a tremendous benefit to the Lompico community to, in fact, bury this pipe. That's correct. That's the only way water gets into the canyon. Yeah, um, it's a short distance, so it's a relatively inexpensive project, but um, it needs funding, and that's we've been looking for funding ever since CZU. It's a high priority. Uh, project. Great. And then the other pipe, which is to that intersection, that's part of our capital improvement plans that we actually have uh, in place now, right? The Zianti Road? That's correct. Uh, that's, uh, I think that's out to bid or close to being out to yeah, bid. It should be out to bid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, do you have a comment? Question. Question. Um, I I missed this earlier. If it was said, is this uh, nearly 1.8 million budgeted? Is it within the capital plan, Rick? It is not budgeted. Uh, there's some money budgeted for geotech and engineering on the Highland Tank. Uh, I think 25,000, uh, but that's about all that's actually in the current biannual budget. Okay. So then on a project by project basis as assuming we get this grant as these items come up are you submitting those to the board then for review and approval we would yes okay. most likely in the next budget year hopefully we'll know if uh when we put our next uh budget together we'll know if we were accepted for these uh grants or not and then we'll have to put them into the budget okay thank you uh, anybody else besides Bob? And then I'll come back to Bob. Okay, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, on the finances part as a preview of coming attractions. Um, you know, our operating margin this year is significantly lower than the, I think, general target that we've been trying to achieve, primarily due to the reduction in um, revenue associated with water sales because our community yet again um, reduced their water consumption, I think about 10 or 11%. Um, if, you, if you look at the five-year projections that were put together as part of the two-year budget that we did, that operating margin goes down even further due to the rapid increase in operating expenses. So something's gonna have to give here one way or the other if we're going to achieve this either we're gonna substitute these projects for others, 
uh, we're going to find operational expense um, uh, flattening of the curve. Um, yeah, uh, this is this needs to be looked at, not just in my opinion in a two-year time frame, but with these kinds of capital projects that are coming up, we need to be taking a much longer view uh, for capital, specifically around capital budgeting, and making sure that we're not just putting together the kinds of capital budgets that were done. 10 years ago where they just changed the year every time and it was basically the same plan. We, we need to get very serious about this. I really appreciate getting these grants. This is definitely a way to stop gap our uh, capital improvement program, but it is only partial uh, part of the answer. I, I will comment on what Bob just said, and that is that the budget and finance committee just recently had a discussion of the operating margin. And actually, Bob, um, for this year so far, our operating margin has been largely what it was. Uh, it's about 0.25. Uh, and the year where it was low was a CZU fire, where it went down to about 0.17. So um, I just want to um, make that be accurate. Um, the other th statement I would make is that, that the operating margin doesn't really take into account um, that a lot of this is based on um, the top kinds of expenditures we're talking about are capital expenditures, which don't figure into the operating expenses. And most of these capital expenditures are presumably going to be funded by in part the balance of the $50 million uh, loan that we had. So I, I don't dispute that we have to you know, constantly keep our eye on the prize in terms of, uh, as you say, bending the curve on operating expenses. But I, I think we just don't want to, we don't want to get too mixed up in um, talking about operating margin when we're talking about operating expenses and uh, talking about planning for capital projects. I, if I may respond to that. Go ahead. The, the operating margin is the key number that allows the district to fund the capital expenses, to fund the loans that get taken out to do the capital expenses. Without a robust operating margin, you cannot do those things. And so the reason that, that you focus on operating expenses is because the lower those are, the more money you have for capital expenses, given that we have somewhere between 15 and $25 million of unfunded capital expenses, a good portion of which is around tanks that have not been maintained. The operating margin is the number that we all need to be looking at from a financial point of view. Um, I'm glad to hear that maybe we're only down. So when the, when the rate increase was done in 2017, it was done in such a way to provide about $3 million of operating expense, uh, operating margin every year going forward. Now, obviously, with disasters, that can't take place. But that $3 million was the target for each of the five years that was in the, the rate increase. So being below that means that we are on the wrong side of our ability to fund capital improvement projects. Um, I'd be happy to go into this in more detail at a future agenda item when we talk about this, but, but the operating margin is something that we absolutely need to be laser focused on. I, I, I'm aware of that, Bob, but I just want to make sure that you had the number right. And most people consider an operating margin of 0.25 to be pretty darn good. So I, I, I don't dispute that we have to keep an eye on it and it does, it does impact our ability to get uh, future funding through loans. But, um, I don't. I, I don't want to paint the picture as being more more grim than it really is. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, so we have uh, the recommendation in front of us. It's kind of seems a little bit curious, but basically what we're oh, and I need to go out to the public, but I'll go out to the public after I I say what. Um, we're basically deciding on today is that because this grant has already been submitted and it's been submitted with uh, the county of Santa Cruz is basically the the the, the main uh, person that's administrating it and we're we're a sub grant we have to um, basically say that Rick Rogers can sign for us and so that's what we're deciding on today 
um, is that the recommendation is that we authorize the district manager to sign on behalf of the district a hazard mitigation grant program memorandum of an understanding with the county of Santa Cruz. So I'll go ahead and move that. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna go out to members of the public to get a discussion of this. Um, anybody wanna say anything about it? I don't see any hands up among our four intrepid members of the public. Um, so we'll come back and uh, Holly, can you take a roll call vote? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. We go to our next item of new business, which is um, a discussion of political activity during the election season. Uh, and Gina, I believe you're going to lead this for us. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Mayhood. Um, I hope all the board members have had a chance to review the memo in the packet, um, which sets forth the particular issues that we're gonna be talking about during this discussion. Um, this of course is not a broad discussion of all you know, governmental ethics principles, which continue to apply through election season, such as Brown Act and other things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's focused on some of the rules that um, particularly seem to get implicated during election seasons. Um, we have been doing in, in recent years, uh, a presentation like this around the beginning of each election season, um, with a view towards rem reminding uh, board and staff members and the public of some of the um, particular election related government ethics issues that seem to come up during the uh, election season. And I, I guess I do want to point out that the memo that you have in front of you um, is based on some, some pretty important rules that, that are derived from the government code, but it also reflects best practices um, that a lot of which come from detailed policies that other agencies have developed for elected officials and staff to comply with, not just during election season, but throughout the year. Um, we don't have such a policy here in the district, but um, what we do, like I said, is, is have this presentation at the beginning of the election season to, to, to make the board and staff aware of these best practices as we go forward. Um, some of these rules will be very, very familiar. I think all board members and, and, and probably even members of the public are familiar with the prohibition against misuse of public funds. Um, this is a rule that, you know, I think it wouldn't be a surprise to anyone to know that, um, you know, for example, you can't use a roll of district stamps to mail, you know, personal letters or campaign mailers or anything of, of that sort. But the rule's a little more broad than that. Um, it extends to prohibiting uh, elected officials, all public officials, elected officials and staff members um, from using district resources for personal uh, purposes, and that includes campaign purposes. And um, some of those things clearly have financial implications like using district office supplies or staff time for personal purposes, but some are a little more subtle, um, such as you know, using email lists, um, bulletin boards, copiers, those kinds of things, uh, even things that don't have kind of a measurable financial cost to the district may fall within this rule to the extent they involve using um, district resources for personal or campaign purposes. Um, the rule becomes even more subtle uh, when you start talking about misuse of, of office. Um, this is really an extension of the same rule that prohibits the misuse of public funds, but it's much more broad to uh, matters that may be construed as kind of a, an abuse of office or an abuse of power, taking advantage of, of, a, of a government position for personal or campaign ends. Um, I've personally seen uh, elected officials run, run afoul of this one because not all elected officials realize, you know, for example, they can't use uh, you know, for example, a photo with, with a government employee in uniform as part of a campaign um, mailer or campaign promotional materials. Um, 
this can include things like sending a personal email or a campaign email from a district email address that has a um, you know that has the, the title that uses the district email address and has the title um, of, a, of a director or a public official. Um, it can include things like um, asking government employees to support a particular cause or campaign. Um, it really extends to, to, to quite a few different things, and I'm happy to answer questions about it if, if that would be helpful. But I think the bottom line principle to remember in terms of misuse of office is that there is kind of a division between what constitutes a district purpose and what constitutes a personal or a campaign purpose. And things that come from things that uh, district resources, district titles, um, photographs of, of individuals in uniform district logos shouldn't be used for campaign or personal purposes as opposed to district purposes. And uh, Director Ackman, did you have a question? I, I did. I think I know the answer to this, but I thought maybe you could answer it for the purposes of public consumption. Um, I, at a, uh, a member of the public held a uh, campaign event for a local assembly person um, uh, uh, last weekend or the weekend before, and as, as it turned out, um, four uh, uh, members of this uh, uh, board were at various times at the event. I don't think any of us really interacted, and we definitely did not talk about water district business, but um, I... I know that it came up in beforehand and I sort of asked the question like, is that going to be a Brown Act issue? And I was told as long as there was no discussion of water district business, if we all happened to be guests at the same event, it wasn't an issue. But could you expand on that, Gina? Sure. Well, I, I think every time one of these issues come up, it's important to be aware of two things. And one is how, how the rule actually applies, number one, and two, how it, a situation may be perceived. And so, um, the Brown Act does, as you know, it prohibits um, communications, whether direct or indirect, among a majority of a legislative body, including the board and committees, um, in any manner that develops a, a consensus among the majority on a matter of, of district business or anything within the jurisdiction of the district. And so, you know, this rule can be implicated in a lot of different ways. And it certainly could be implicated if, you know, if four directors went to a social event, which is not strictly prohibited under the Brown Act, but then, you know, had a series of communications over the beverage table or something about um, some issue coming up on the agenda or maybe a future agenda. So it, it is certainly not a Brown Act violation for four directors to, to be at an event like that at different times. And then the question becomes, um, how do you manage the perception that somebody may think something nefarious is going on? And, you know, a variety of suggestions around that. And, you know, the most obvious of being it's almost never a good idea to have three or more directors kind of huddled together outside of a public meeting under any circumstances. Um, but you know, there's a, there's a, a you can think of a million different scenarios or ways that the Brown Act could be implicated. And I guess I just encourage everybody to keep in mind: one, there's the technical rule, and two, there's the perception. And so, if you find yourself in a situation like that, it's worth thinking about: you know, what can I do to make sure that nobody thinks that even though I'm over here talking about the weather, that I am talking about what's on the agenda, actually talking about what's on the agenda next week. Any, I, I just want to say, Gina, that um, I, I really appreciated this memo. It made me think about some things in terms of how I, you know, even though I'm, I'm not somebody who's running, um, just the issues of misuse of office and how you speak about things um, at meetings is important, you know, at, at this for the next few months, especially. And um, also the, the 60 day rule about um, mass mailings and things coming out from the district. And we, so we have to be, you know, very, very careful about, for example, any letters that I would write, you know, on behalf of the board that. That that's probably a period of time where we probably don't want to do that because of uh, there might be misperceptions. So any anyway, I appreciate it. Um, Bob. Yeah, I think on that uh, topic of mailers, I, if we don't have a policy in this, I think there definitely should be that, you know, glossy mailers going out, um, you know, touting infrastructure projects or what have you. Uh, even a few months before the election is is not a really good idea. 
um, 2018 saw something like that, and it, it really, it, it, I think, was not a good look for the district. Or excuse me, not 2018, 2014. Anyway. Any other? If I could say a, 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 a few more words before we wrap up, I think mass mailing kind of got covered to the extent that, that it needs to, but I did want to say just a couple things about item three on the second page, district <laughs> functions and communication. I'm not going to go through each one of the, the points that's in the memo because um, everyone, uh, everyone. Yeah. Um, I did want to underscore, you know, just broadly that, that these, the items in number three are all about the fact that the campaign is something that happens um, loosely speaking, you know, out there, <laughs> whereas district business happens in here. So in, at board meetings, committee meetings, any kind of district function or event, um, the purpose of these rules is just to say, um, you know, please don't use those venues to talk about anybody. The fact, you know, the, the fact there's an election, that any particular director is up for election, um, anybody's candidacy, uh, you know, there's obviously things that are going to be talked about in district meetings that are also being talked about out in the campaign because they're important to the district. But the key is not to focus here in the district meetings and events on the fact that those are like election or campaign issues or that anybody is running for office or as a candidate for office or, um, you know, what their views are as a candidate, et cetera. Um, and if, if there's questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. But um, that that was the last thing that I wanted to say about the memo before we move on. Are there any questions or comments by members of the board? Um, <laughs> yeah, Jeannie, you, you spoke about this applying to both board members and staff, um, but this isn't intended in any way to limit um, individuals' ability to participate in the political process as individuals. Yeah, absolutely not. It's about keeping that activity outside of the district offices, working hours, district meetings and events. Just, just so that's real clear. It's, it needs to have a robust conversation in the community. Thank you. Okay. Can I, um, is, I guess we should see if there's any members of the public that have a question along this um, line. Anybody want to ask a question or make a comment? If not, um, then we can go on to the consent agenda. Um, would anybody like to pull anything off the consent agenda? All right. Um, Given there's no response, oh wait, do I need to ask members of the public? Are any members of the public want to take something off the consent agenda? Don't see any. All right, then we move on to district reports, and right now we basically only have the one, which is from the district manager. And I have nothing to report tonight. Okay. Um, and so the final item that we'll talk about is um, the uh, written communication um, where we got an email back from uh, J.M. Brown, uh, Bruce McPherson's assistant, about the letter that the board sent. And so in addition to that, I've asked Rick to uh, comment on further developments, which I think are encouraging um, along this line. So. Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, the um, uh, Supervisor McPherson's A.J. and Brown um, has made contact with the district. In fact, has came has come into the office, and we spoke. And they, um, uh, the initial feasibility study did really not include uh, the Bear Creek Estates, San Luis Valley Water District, Bear Creek Estates facility. Um, However, that they have now contacted Public Works uh, and Public Works um, which are, are trying to work in the Bear Creek Estates facility. Um, and it appears that it's getting some traction with Public Works to be included. Now, uh, you know, that's great to hear that, and, but until we see some types of reports where we have, you know, additional contact uh, by the county uh, the district is still aggressively seeking support uh, from other agencies. We sent a letter out to LAFCO 
get their support and we'll be um, meeting with some key representatives of the Valley to try to get support and also uh, scheduling meeting with the Bear Creek Estates uh, homeowners to um, inform them of uh, what we're doing and, and to uh, get them to uh, write Supervisor McPherson in support. Um, I do know uh, maybe Jamie would like to, uh, she's had some discussion with some of our uh, political leaders, which has been very helpful. And I've heard that that discussion has already returned to Supervisor McPherson. So there is a lot moving on that subject. Jamie, did you want to add to that? Sure. I just, um, I, I had a meeting with uh, Senator Laird last week um, and uh, I, I raised the Bear Creek Estates issue. He agreed that he would um, send a letter, which I, I sent him, uh, Chair Mayhood, the letter that you um, signed off on. And uh, But it sounds like instead of sending a letter, he's decided to reach out directly, which I think is even better because it's more timely. Um, you know, and then um, I think that uh, there were also some folks who were doing some outreach to Assemblymember Stone's office um, to try and secure his support as well. So um, that's my update. Bob? I'm, I'm really glad to hear that there might be some movement in this area that, you know, this was something that needed to be addressed. And of course, the fire, you know, really sidelined a lot of priority around it. So I'm glad this is coming back. You know, it's really clear from the earlier report that the community cannot afford a replacement uh, of existing or even close to existing type technology. So unless the county is going to do something different, um, they're, they're kind of stuck and we're kind of stuck because of it. Right. And, and I know Carly uh, on this subject, Carly has spoken with uh, our grant writer and um, they believe that for consolidation, such as small water systems, there's also funding the state for consolidations of small wastewater into larger. Right. So we're trying to, uh, to address this from several fronts because we know it will not be a cheap uh, capital project to bring that wastewater to Boulder Creek to get it uh, to, uh, up into CSA 7. Right. Okay. Any other comments by members of the board on that? Um, would any members of the public like to comment on that? Well, if not, um, I will, without objection, apologize for my barking dogs who are defending me from a doe and her fawn uh, and adjourn the meeting. <laughs> and they did a good job. <laughs> good night. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. It's 747 and we are adjourned.